was nearly a century ago, 1922 to be precise, when the very famous English poet T.S. Eliot published his poem, The Wasteland. And many people consider this poem to be one of the great works of English literature, certainly one of the great works of English literature in the 20th century, and certainly one of the great poems of the English language. And I'm not going to spend too much time on the poem itself, but needless to say, it's a poem or a meditation upon the state of the world, above all reflecting upon the immediate past, which is to say the events of World War I. And I think that we who live a century later often struggle to grasp how much of an impact that war had on the world and the people who experienced it. So the wasteland in many ways is a tribute, a meditation to many different things. Psychological trauma, brokenness, loss, all these things that one would imagine in a wasteland. But to the people who lived back then, World War I was perhaps the defining human event of all history, which is to say it ruined the land, it leveled everything. And when T.S. Eliot writes this, he's writing it in a sense of remembering all that was and what came to pass after the war. And it's interesting that for that generation, there really was something required called war to bring about this condition, to bring about this observation, and in some sense the landscape that followed World War I was in fact a wasteland, at least according to his interpretation. But you might be asking, why am I mentioning T.S. Eliot and World War I and the wasteland? Well, mention it because we also live in a wasteland, and it's eerily similar and yet eerily different at the same time. And I jump from T.S. Eliot, a famous eloquent English poet, to a character in a book and film, none other than Tyler Durden, who could probably be viewed as a thug. And yet what he had to say, and this is something I've quoted a number of times in the past, seems so appropriate and so accurate concerning our own time and, and us, we who inhabit this epoch, the denizens of 2021, although he said it more than two decades earlier. We're the middle children of history, man. No purpose or place. We have no great war, no great depression. Our great war is a spiritual war. Our great depression is our lives. Now, why do I mention that? Well, for the simple reason that it provides such a massive contrast to the poem The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot, a poem that is quite literally, in most of its aspects, about the devastation of World War I and the effects it had on the landscape and human psychology. And then Tyler Durden comes around in the 1990s and says, well, we don't have a great war. There's no massive economic depression, at least as yet, not at that time. And yet, why on earth are we the miserable wretches that we are? Now, in the 1990s, we're actually a long time ago, all things considered. What would Tyler Durden say in 2021? He thought it was bad back then. Well, as they say, he ain't seen nothing yet. So what is this wasteland of 2021, the one we inhabit? Well, it's a bit complicated. But as usual, as is often the case, the United States is the epicenter of this, although the entire West has been affected, and arguably the entire globe. Because unlike World War I, there wasn't a great loss of life, destruction, leveling of civilization. And yet, we see apparitions of many of the things you could observe in the wake of a massive war. Depression, people taking their own lives, etc., etc. What has happened? Well, here's the fundamental problem. And I think it's related to a fundamental issue of how we, or rather the powers that be, view the world. For quite some time now, really accelerating the 90s, ever since the fall of the Soviet Union, the Iron Curtain, if you will, there's been a view, some people call it neoliberalism, that material goods 
and achieving material wealth is the greatest goal one can pursue and arrive at. That buying that house, that car, having the big screen TV back in the day, alternatively having the best computer possible. These are all things that are supposed to enrich us. In some way they do. Material wealth does enrich us. But in all these calculations about GDP and material goods and wealth, there's always something missing. And it's something that is perhaps immeasurable. I don't like to use the word spiritual because I don't even know what that means. But there are certain things you simply cannot measure. And we can observe this trend for decades, only in recent times being accelerated up to the wazoo, that people are less content than ever. Social relations are absolutely abysmal. Because we spend a lot of time talking about how messed up relationships are with women and the absolutely dismal prospects with respect to marriage. But one thing I've noticed in the youngest generation is they don't even have friends anymore, not real friends. I remember a time decades and decades ago where I grew up in a major city where you could still rely on your neighbor in a large apartment building of all places. You could say, look, we're going on a holiday for a few days. Can you pick up the mail? And they would do it. How many people actually know people these days, neighbors, that you actually trust? I'm not saying there aren't any. There just aren't many. Certainly not in comparison to the past. And so we've hunkered down and become mistrustful of other people. We don't even trust ourselves anymore very much. And we're more isolated, arguably, than ever. For all the connectivity we experience via the Internet, it amounts to effectively not. Because it is a wasteland of sorts. Not the same one that T.S. Eliot was getting at, but the one that Tyler Durden prophesied and described even back in the 90s. And it shot through every facet of our lives. It's not just that quote-unquote romantic relationships are broken. Everything is broken. The reliability of human connection, even the level of friendship, is broken. Think about how it manifests itself online, so-called communities. When people talk about community, they don't mean what it used to mean. People that rely on each other work together. They mean cabals of people of particular interest or ideological bent who gather together to reinforce their own ideas so they can feel nominally comfortable and they eschew everything else. That's what they mean. The idea of community, neighbors you can rely on, people you talk to down the block, that doesn't really exist anymore. Or to the extent it does, it's disappearing rather rapidly. And I say this myself as a denizen of the internet. The internet is not a replacement for it. What the internet does, typically, is it allows you to create quote-unquote relationships with fellow human beings that are at best tissue thin. It's a veneer. And you can remove the veneer at will. People come and go, of course, in life. But that coming and going throughout the history of our species has never been as easily facilitated as it has been now. And so the devastation, the wasteland we live in, is in some ways far worse than the wasteland in the post-World War I landscape of T.S. Eliot. Because despite World War II, something they didn't know about at the time, there was a sense that things indeed could be rebuilt. But what can be rebuilt within the technocracy that we live in? The things that actually matter to human beings, real connections, they hardly exist anymore. And I think the Zoomer is, for better or worse, mostly for worse, the personification of this. I'm not criticizing the Zoomer as an entity, per se, just that when I observe the Zoomer, the typical Zoomer doesn't even know what a real friend is. And I don't blame him. It's not his fault. He's been starved of it. The very infrastructure that ushered in his existence, the Zoomer's existence, has by dint of its very nature collaborated to prevent him from achieving normal human friendships and relationships. And I'm not even talking about the romantic stuff. I see this time and again the bored Zoomer surfing online in search of some cure-all to his ennui. But it never arrives. And time passes and they get older. And then there's the other aspect of how we naturally communicate. We did evolve to varying degrees 
to read faces. Women are better than men. But to sit or stand across somebody and communicate, to engage with the person as a real entity, we don't really do that anymore. And the lure of that, the seductive power of that is obvious. I like it too, not having to do that. With a push of a button or a click of a mouse, you can interact with somebody and you can leave. No effort required. It's great. But the question I would pose is, is this great for developing children? Is it great for the youngest generation? Because for better or worse, I am fortunate to have grown up without this stuff. I got to go through the quote-unquote normal process, however bad or good that might be. But the Zoomer, as the embodiment of the end result of this wasteland, he has no idea what the world is like other than this particular model that he has been born into. There might not have been a war, but when you look at the social landscape, the devastation is very much akin to a war-torn landscape. It's becoming nigh impossible, especially for young people, to find something they can cling to of any substance. And we're all guilty of this to varying degrees. I'm not fundamentally different. I appreciate the ephemerality of the internet and its ability to facilitate things with great ease as well as the ability it gives me to retract any interest I might have at a moment's notice. It's great. It's very tempting. But I also realize it doesn't nourish my quote-unquote soul, whatever that means. And one aspect of this that makes it this much worse is that the massive amount of technology, this veneer I spoke of, that covers it all up, facilitates and accelerates the decay because it seems like everything's peachy keen. It seems like everything is just bloody fantastic, doesn't it? All this technology, and it's improving, and making our lives better. But on the other hand, it covers up all the pain, the destruction, the loss of life, the depression, the anxiety, all these things that are burgeoning and bubbling up below the surface. Because it allows us to distract ourselves so efficiently that we forget who we are and what we are. And it's only going to get worse as time goes by. This epoch allows us to pretend everything is fine when it's not. Because the people who like to pretend everything is fine like to toss about things such as GDP and how great it is, and how the economy is doing well, and this and that. I'm not saying it is doing well, just what they claim. Everything is fine because you have a MacBook Pro or a smartphone or PlayStation 5 came out, so don't worry. And you can get gourmet sushi at the local supermarket. Isn't that great? I think we're really missing something fundamentally, and I think it's one of the reasons why we see this resurgence of religion in many camps. People are desperate for something of substance. And I'm not even necessarily claiming religion is something of substance, but at least it offers people some perspective other than you have more than enough to eat and you have lots of gadgets. No, the wasteland is most definitely real, but you have to take the time to look below the surface to find it, because it's so well hidden, it's so well hidden, and all the innovations around us allow us to hide it that much more. It's going to get worse, a lot worse. Mark my words. Anyway, thanks for tuning in. As always, please hit the like button, subscribe if you've not yet done so, hit the bell icon to be informed of forthcoming videos, and share the video. And if I'm still alive, I'll check you out later. As always, may the gods watch over you. You take care. And until the next time. If you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.